I had a boss that he, he said to me, you know, I don't understand how you can call yourself an engineer. I literally went home crying that day, but it pushed me and it motivated me. And I just started reading as many books as I could. So here I am, I'm replaying Dude. those guys, <laughs> my early career, you call yourself an engineer. And yeah. I'm literally saying that to myself. It took me four times to pass that data center uh, exam. It was very, very tough. What I was really interested in, I was always interested in was the communications aspect. You know, I was dialing BBSs in 1998 that were in Paris using uh, hacked PBXs and things of that nature. So, but it definitely gave me sort of a leg up on learning computers, learning programming skills, you know, sometimes the failure is what teaches us the most lessons. So um, I could have taken the exam many years before, maybe I might have failed it, um, but then I would have been able to, you know, know exactly what's on the exam, turn around and knock it out a few months later. If you fail, it's not like you have to go and do another year of university. If you fail today, you take what you've learned, you go and fix those bad areas, like you said, and then next month you go and do it again. Hey everyone, it's David Bombal back with a very special guest, Stefan, welcome. Good morning, how are you? I'm doing well, Stefan, great to have you on the show. I was doing a bit of research, you know, looking a bit, a bit, a bit about you on uh, LinkedIn and I was amazed, man. How many JNCIEs do you have? Right now I've got five, which is pretty cool. And uh, one of the things that uh, is, is kind of unique about that is right now there's actually only four expert level certifications offered. Uh, there used to be a fifth one, the JNCIE Cloud, and, and that one was recently decommissioned. So um, I'm kind of in a little bit of a unique position of being one of the few people in the world that have five JNCIEs right now. That's, I mean, the word I would have used is that's insane. I mean, the amount of work to do that, it, it, that's hard, hard work. So, I mean, perhaps you can tell us a bit about your story and your journey. And, you know, I know you you you, you run your own business these days, but um, perhaps you can tell us about that and, you know, tell us about how you went from zero to, to hero um, where you are at the moment. Definitely studying for JNCIEs and, and I have a number of other certifications as well, but that 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 took literally years of my life to it to accomplish. Uh, I mean, I think it's kind of like equivalent to maybe so somebody studying for a bar exam. That says you've been here since 6.30. I thought I'd jumpstart the bar exam work. Something along those lines, but uh, I basically, where do you, where should I begin? <laughs> you want me to start at the very beginning? Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, give us inspiration because I mean, I, I, I saw you got NT4 years and years ago and then you were Novell before right. that. Tell us a little bit about no, the journey. Yeah, so um, yeah, let, I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my story and how I got into IT. And I, I definitely took a more non-traditional path. Um, Which is where, great to hear. Yeah. Um, I, I was working as an electrician out, out of high school but I had always been really good with computers. I ran bulletin board systems um, in the late 80s, early 90s when I was a teenager out of the home, uh, much to my parents' chagrin because these were mostly like freaking hacking type related bulletin board systems that I was running back then. Uh, but it definitely gave me sort of a leg up on learning computers, learning programming skills, um, you know, and then like what I was really interested in, I was always interested in was the communications aspect. You know, I was dialing BBSs uh, in 1998 that were in Paris using uh, hacked PBXs and things of that nature. So I always knew I liked that field. I loved communications and, and networking in general. Uh, but out of high school, I was doing a little bit of school. I was doing some, some college, but I was also working as an electrician, um, as an electrician's apprentice. And I remember one day just, I was working really, you know, hard manual labor running cable through ceilings. And I just said, you know, why am I doing this? Like I, I could exactly. be, you know, I'm really into computers. This was uh, around 94, 95. And, you know, the whole thing was just really starting to, to pick up. So I just decided to go to a computer school. Um, and I did some college, but I basically took a non-traditional path where I, I, once I started making money in the industry, I was like, I don't really need to finish and, and get the college degree. I just started pursuing some certifications. I got my CNE uh, three and then CNE four. So my first introduction to networking was with Novell. Basically, as soon as I got my CNE at that point in time, Microsoft really came onto the scene. And it was almost like I just spent a year and a half studying for all this Novell stuff. And it was almost out of date by the time I got it because everybody was asking for NT certifications. So now I started pursuing my MCSE and uh, got a number of different Microsoft certifications. And that was really cool. I was doing server side 
you know, uh, Active Directory, Microsoft Exchange, you know, SQL Server, that kind of stuff. But in the back of my mind, I always really, really loved networking. And, you know, Cisco was out there and I would go to on the job sites and I'd see like a Cisco router and I'd be like, wow, that is just the coolest thing. That is what I really want to be doing. Uh, but it was it was hard to break in, you know, to go from the server side uh, and then, you know, to make that transition over to the networking side was pretty tough. I, I basically started reading like Cisco press books back then, you know, just learning as much about networking as I could. Naturally, I already had some TCP IP background. Um, and then, you know, during my studies of MCSE and also CNE, I had some some networking background, but I really needed to learn like the routing piece. And I just started learning that by reading Cisco press books and basically being a sponge to anything that I could get my hands on. And I was lucky. Um, not everybody has this this uh, you know good fortune, but I managed to talk to a guy who gave me um, really my first job in the networking industry. It was at a, a really little company. Maybe you guys might have heard of it. It's called UUNet uh, back in the day. But this guy, um, his name's Atik Ahmad. He you know took me under his wing and, and gave me my very first networking job, and I will forever be. Um, indebted and thankful to him for taking uh, a chance on me. But it was rough. I mean, it was rough because I got into this uh, industry and in the networking side and I was pretty green. And I'm working at UUNet, which at the time, AS701 was the largest service provider in the world. They were the backbone, you know, now and now they, they are part of Verizon, uh, that, that AS. So AS701, AS702 and AS703 were originally UUNet. And I'm jumping in with some pretty sharp, talented people, people that had PhDs, people that had master de- master's degrees, people that had been working in networking for some time, you know, maybe they had been working with X25 or Frame Relay. And, you know, I'm jumping in, learning ATM on the fly and MPLS and those types of things. But it was basically sucking it through a fire hose as far as like learning and trying to keep up uh, with these folks. But I mean, I mean, I'm, I love what you said because I mean, I, I've written down a few notes. But like, let's start with that one. You know, when we when you start out, like with networking or any new tech, it just seems so overwhelming. So I mean, you've walked this road. So can you, whenever we like, when we talk, can you always like pitch it to someone perhaps who's who's either young? And I get some pushback on my channel about that. I don't want to just look at someone who's young, but someone who's transitioning, because a lot of people who watch this are perhaps like electricians mm-hmm. or. Uh, bus drivers or work in McDonald's and they're trying to get into networking or like get into IT. So always phrase it that way. So do you have, uh, uh, imposter syndrome is a big problem a lot of people face. Like I could never learn this. It's overwhelming. So what's your advice? Because I mean, you've went from like, I'm working with a PhD, I'm not good enough to like five JNCIEs. To, to kind of describe the path and why I ended up pursuing so many certifications. Not at the end of the day, I just want to say, I don't necessarily think certifications are the bar that illustrate whether or not you actually know a technology. I know plenty of people that are certification on paper only, uh, but they don't really have the skills to back it up. So I'm not necessarily advocating just taking certifications for certification's sake. But in my case, it's... Um, it's a it's a way to have like a structured learning path. As I'm learning the material, I can go and take a certification and sort of test my knowledge. Um, and it's just a, a way to reinforce, um, you know, what I, what I've learned. Now, the reason I pursued so many, you know, we talked about CNE. There was MCSE. There's CISSP. There's Juniper certs. I have Cisco certs. I have a whole bunch. VMware. You name it. I I think that that whole imposter syndrome that I faced on my early days at uh, UUNet, and I mean there were days that I just wanted to go home and cry. I would ask, <laughs> I would ask, you know, you know, I'm working on on maybe testing ATM or something, and I'd go to one of my colleagues and ask them, hey, what do these little symbols mean? You know, and it turns out it's like the symbols for you know microsecond or nanosecond, and and th- they're literally like saying to me. I'm not. I'm not even kidding. Saying you call yourself an engineer, how, how can you? Oh, wow. How can you call yourself an engineer? And you don't. You don't know these things. Or like the lambda symbol. I started doing a lot of work with uh, with uh, w- DWDM in those days, and you know, first time I'm seeing some of these symbols like lambda. So yeah, people were basically making you know treating me like a redheaded stepchild in that workplace, making me feel pretty bad. I, I wow. literally. That's I bad. had a bo- I had a boss that he he said to me, you know, I don't understand how you can call yourself an engineer, um, and I I literally went home crying that day. But it pushed me and it motivated me 
Um, and I just started reading as many books as I could. So uh, got my hand on as many Cisco press books as I could. You know, I was working with protocols. So, I mean, I'm getting a book on ISIS. I'm getting a book on BGP. I'm getting a book on OSPF. I'm literally reading the RFCs. Um, I just made it a goal of mine to prove these people wrong. Um, Love it. And, Love it. you know, within, it's, it's kind of funny because the same people that, you know, that there were times where I would be asking for help and, and they just kind of just didn't want to deal with me. So I realized I, ha I had to kind of like pull myself up by my own bootstraps. Um, but the funny thing is, you know, I, I immersed myself in it. And about a year later, the same people that were laughing at me saying, how do you call yourself an engineer uh, that didn't really want anything to do? All of a sudden they're coming and they're asking me questions or hey do you can i borrow that book uh hey do well you know done. how this works do you know how this works in in isis and yep well so and, and they're wanting to work on projects with me and things like that so it was a really a sense of vindication i think um but yeah in it, my yeah. case yeah. i i the imposter syndrome has very much been a part of my desire to not 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 necessarily prove to other people, but prove to myself. Um, and I mean, I still I think we all suffer from that to a certain extent. Uh, you know, I've got five JNCIEs, but there are so many times that I'm working with people, and I just think, man, this guy is just so brilliant. Um, I, I'm constantly learning from other people. I love that. I mean, it's like the the kind of people you always want to work with. Uh, I think are people who are humble, who know that the more you know, the more you realize there's more to know, and you can't know everything. So, I mean, it, it, you're the kind of guy that you want in your team, not someone who's arrogant, who thinks they know everything. But you've got to tell us, the, the, the JNCIEs, what, have you, what are they in? Because I would assume it's writing and switching, but then perhaps some others as well, right? Yeah, so it's, it's actually a little bit different than, um, than like maybe like the Cisco track. So the, yep. there's five or there's four now. There was a fifth. I'll talk about that one. Uh, but there's service provider. Okay, yep. so SP, JNCIE, SP, there's ENT, which is enterprise. Yep. Uh, there's SEC, which is security. And then there's DC, which is data center. And there used to be a dash cloud, which was more around their cloud products, Contrail and those types of things. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of overlap, right? You're, you're, you're learning, you're doing routing and switching in many of these tracks, but the focus is a little bit different. It's like, is this applicable to like a data center environment where you might be doing like VXLAN, you're doing EVPN versus say, you know, an enterprise where you're probably doing more like spanning tree, you're doing VLANs, you're doing, um, you know, VoIP and telephony and those types of things. So it's just kind of the focus area is a little bit different depending on the track. I, I love it. I mean, one of the things I, I love about certs is I always like to say you don't know what you don't know. The certs help you do things that are out of your comfort zone. I think if it's like if you're just in one environment, you might get a bit like stale because you're just used to working on certain protocols and now you're forced to learn a whole bunch of other stuff, right? It was so much fun for me going through these journeys um, of, you know, um, you know, the first one that I took took about two years, the service rider track. At, at the time it was called, um, it was the JNCIE-M that's what, what it was called is now the service rider. And this was based on their M series, their flagship product, um, which eventually this evolved to the service rider track. But that one took me several years. And in fact, uh, here's just a little bit of advice for some of your viewers. Um, I had been working with Juno since 1998, and I didn't actually pursue my first JNCIE until about 2007. So that was like nine years or something like that had gone by yeah. um, before I decided to actually pursue my first JNCIE. And the reason for that, because I felt like I needed to learn more about networking. I just felt like I wasn't ready. Um, you know, so it's like, I'm reading one more book on this protocol. I'm learning. And basically I went in and took the test and I passed on my first try and I realized I w had been ready way, I mean, I, I way overdid it. So my advice to anybody that may be interested in pursuing like one of these expert level certifications is, is if you've got maybe a couple of years of experience under your belt, you're probably more than ready to just do like a focus preparation and study the actual materials that are going to be on the exam. But, you know, my advice is you don't need to wait nine years like I did, um, so I, then I just started knocking them out at that point because I was like, hey, man, this is way easier than I thought it would. 
I think, I mean, it's tough, hey, because I mean, some people who study for these, uh, these like expert level certs, they fail and it's going to be a long, hard journey. And I mean, they would just say you're a genius. That's why it's easy for you, right? I don't, I, I think I just had, at that, at that point, I had had so much stick time working on the CLI yeah. with Junos yeah. that, you know, nine years, it was like secondhand nature for me. And of course, I was working at GigUnet in a service rider environment. So I was working with MPLS. I was working with traffic engineering. I was working yeah. with class of service, multicast, all those types of things on pretty much a regular basis. So if you are in an environment where you're getting, you're not just studying for it on your free time, but you're actually doing this in your day-to-day job, then you're going to be better positioned to to pass an exam like that. So, I mean, I feel bad because I, I, knew, I know there's, there's a lot of people that it takes them two, three, four times to pass. Um, but I think at that point, I just had had like ample experience behind me. I think what you've highlighted there is like experience is a, is a huge enabler. I mean, someone who hasn't had experience and perhaps just reads the books, it could be a lot harder, a harder journey, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so I will talk a little bit about some of the materials out there for anybody that's interested in maybe pursuing some of the Juniper certifications. There's some really excellent free training options out there for people. Um, one of the things that that doesn't include is actually access to devices that you can log into. And, you know, that's really critical for, um, you know, hey, anybody can break into the industry, maybe with the the associate level. I think you can go and just read that material and pursue the exam and you'll have the baseline knowledge without actually having touched a device to, to be fine with path, passing the exam. But if you want to really move up the stack to those higher level certifications, you know, there, there's, there's no amount of just training. You're going to have to have some physical hands-on access to devices and, and ha- spend some, some stick time, um, you know, working with the CLI. Stefan, just before we Go any further. I wanted to get a bit of input about your business and like your social media, because hopefully people can you know connect to you on Twitter and other places. But perhaps you can just tell us about like your socials and and, and your business and what you get up to these days. Yeah, sure. Thanks, David. So um, I am the CTO of a company called Shortest Path First. I actually Love started. The name. <laughs> it's based on <laughs> Dijkstra <laughs> algorithm. So yeah. so I, the way it got got it started is actually. I had been blogging for years under the moniker shortest path first, um, just because I have a passion for routing protocols and algorithms and things of that nature. Um, and then, uh, you know, I've been blogging under that um, domain name for many years. And then when I decided that I wanted to start my own business, it kind of dawned upon me that I already have all this um, SEO. Um, there's all this search engine uh, optimization that would happen as a result of all these blog articles that I had already written out there. So I just named my company after my blog. Uh, shortest path first. And yeah, that's pretty much what we do is we focus on, um, you know, routing, switching, security, tends to focus a lot on Juniper, but we do Palo Alto, Arista, Fortinet, um, VMware, primarily just consulting, reselling, traditional value added reseller type operation. Um, Our website is www.spfirst.net or if you are so inclined and you wanna type the whole thing out, you can go to shortestpathfirst.net. And we have YouTube, we've got Facebook, we've got LinkedIn, we've got Twitter. Um, I think it's not that hard to search on these things, but yeah, if you just Google shortest path first, all one word, no spaces, uh, you'll basically be able to find all of those things. So we've got some light board videos on YouTube and some other cool interviews. Not quite as cool as the one that David has with his channel here, but uh, <laughs> something to aspire to. I appreciate it. I, for everyone who's watching, I've put those links below. Go and show the love. Stefan, they can contact you on Twitter perhaps with questions. Just for everyone watching, please don't like overrun them with thousands of questions. But is, is what's the best way to like interact with you? Is it LinkedIn, Twitter? Where's a good place? Yeah, Twitter's a great place. I'm pretty active on Twitter. So I would definitely be happy to respond there. LinkedIn is fine too. I'm, I'm very much open in terms of my networking. So um, if we're not connected on LinkedIn, I'm very happy to make your acquaintance and uh, I would be happy to make that connection. So. Yeah, let me ask you some hard questions because this is the questions I get from the audience. So like the first thing is I don't have money. I'm perhaps not based in the US, I'm based somewhere else. But I think you've, you've already alluded to that. The training from Juniper is free, right? There's so many good um, options right here. But yeah, if you go to Juniper's website and just go to training, you'll see all this good stuff right here. Now, I, I, I realize we're talking mostly about Juniper. You know, th- for other vendors, there's similar options and things. But yeah, for Juniper, there's this link right here, free training. I, I was actually blown away by this today. Pretty much all the associate level curriculum for 
you know, all the different tracks. You've got cloud security, mists, there's a design associate. So they've got a tremendous amount of free stuff here that's available to you. All you basically need to do is just click the link and subscribe, zero dollars. And it has so many good stuff. Here's one, for example, for somebody who might have like a CCNA and they are wanting to learn Junos, they can subscribe to this one. And it has a whole bunch of modules, basically giving somebody who already has sort of that Cisco background, the knowledge of how do I transition over to Juniper. And then after going through these modules, they are even offering you discounted vouchers. So you just take like a practice uh, or what they call a voucher assessment test. And if you get 70% or higher, they give you 75% off. So you can basically get a certification at the associate level for just $50 and a little bit of your time. That's the long-winded answer to your question on, you know, how does somebody that maybe is sort of limited in funds, you know, pursue some of these certifications? And I will just point out that if you get the JNCIA in a particular track, then they have the specialist level and they have similar free training at the specialist level. And they have similar free training at the professional level as well. So as you get these certifications, they're, they're providing a lot of options. Now, well, let me just state that these, um, this free curriculum that they're offering here, this is basically like the slideware only, and it, it's like the student guide. Um, the one thing you don't have is you don't have access to devices. So, you, you know, if you want to practice and learn these skills um, in real time, like you're going to still need to, you know, maybe hack up a lab or something like that to get get some of this stuff up and running. But this at least gives you the the courseware. Um, and the fact that a lot of it's being offered for, for free is just pretty cool. I mean, it's like we've, we've been both been in the game a long time. I mean, I, I remember years ago having to spend like thousands or people were spending thousands of dollars a week for training like this. And it's it's fantastic that Juniper offering this for free. I mean, it takes away that whole excuse, right? I, I love what your story was like. These guys are like saying bad things about me. I'm not, I'm not happy in my place or the position I'm in, but I'm going to study now. I'm going to buy books mm-hmm. or whatnot. It's, the onus is now on the person who's watching to go and get this material because it's free. And then, right. all, like you said, all they, all they need to do is spend the time and then like $50 for associate. I mean, that, that's amazing. I love that. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's really, you know, people are going to have to put in some modicum amount of investment into their future, yeah. but it doesn't exactly. necessarily have to be a lot. You know, and there's lots of options out there for somebody that wants to maybe spin up a Juniper device and actually get some hands on. They don't have to go out and buy a physical device. You can even go onto AWS Marketplace and you can just turn up um, a, like a, a, a trial license of VSRX. And uh, VSRX is Juniper's firewall device, but you can convert that into packet mode. And in which case it operates just like a traditional Juniper router. And you can run MPLS, you can run BGP, OSPF, you can run all those things. So there's lots of options. And that's like a way people can get hands on with the with the equipment without actually having access to physical devices. Do you run labs on your computer, like using GNS3 or even G or something like that? Uh, Yeah. So I used to do it all in VMware. Um, I have had some pretty extensive lab setups when I was doing a lot of my JNCIEs. um, You know, earlier on, I was doing it in like right on my MacBook, VMware Fusion on on Mac. Um, But I also have an ESXi server. So I have a lot of stuff running in in VMware. But it's it's kind of the way that you stitch VMs in those environments. Like if you want to build big labs with, say, like, you know, 10, 12 routers, doing it in VMware is a little bit, it's not very intuitive. You've got to go to the V switch and interconnect everything. So yeah, these days I'm tending to play around more with like GNS3, which is kind of like a network modeling simulation tool. I'm, I'm sure most of your um, viewers are probably familiar with that, but it's very similar to, to Eve or even G or GNS3. Those are the two that I that I spend most of my time with. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've, I did it a while ago. I mean, to, to, to spin up a Junos device in, in, in GNS3 and then connect it to like multiple devices. And I mean, devices from many vendors, it's so easy. And right. even, even G does the same. The question is like training is free. You can download this stuff for free. You can yep. run it on even G or GNS3. So you've got no excuse about not labbing. So you can lab it up. The exams are not, not expensive. So I, I think it, it comes down to like, what are you going to do about it? Like you have to put the effort in. Sorry, go on. So uh, Juniper also has this um, Elevate community, which is, you know, basically 
it used to be called JNet Forms, but it's uh, it's just a form where people can share information, ask questions. And there is a whole training and certification thing right here where there's all kinds of questions where people are, hey, I'm going through for, for this certification. Anybody have any advice? So there's a lot of really, really good discussion on the Elevate community under the training and certification uh, community. So that's an excellent resource for anybody that might be you know, preparing for these exams as well. You say it's like forums, right? So you can ask questions and then people help you. Yeah, it's a it's a forum or discussion board. You can see there's lots of different uh, topics and things like that. So if somebody wants to learn just about switching, there's a whole section of, of Elevate community, which is just focused on switching. And you can see it's this place that is where people can come and ask questions. And there's lots of really, really sharp people that are answering uh, questions all day. But yeah, there's an excellent resource in the Elevate community for training and certification. So anybody that's interested in pursuing this and they're like, hey, where do I start? You know, how do I get access to, you know, what, what would it look like if I had to build a lab uh, for this? There's a just excellent resource right there. Yeah, I mean, I love it. Again, the barriers are, are, have been removed a lot, right? Um, and there's one thing that you mentioned like when we spoke offline about time. I'm, I'm assuming it's like that you waited, what was it, seven years, nine years was it, that you waited, you, you, you wasted too much time, right? Yeah, I wasted a lot of time. And see, funny how it is. Yeah, so I was working with Junos for nine years when I finally decided to go and take my uh, exam. And I was in my late 20s at this time, early 30s. I mean, I had had all the time in the world to do these things, but for some reason I, I put it off. It wasn't until I had my daughter, um, when, which you would think like now I actually have a lot less time on my hands. Exactly. And that yeah. somehow like motivated me to finally go and pursue the JNC. I said, okay, you know, I've been putting this off for too long, um, but it's funny how things like that can kind of give you the kick or the motivation to take the next step towards something in your career. Um, and I think I was just at a point where I was like, okay, I had done a number of other certifications. I had been pushing this expert level one off for many years. I just, I don't think I had enough. Uh, I didn't, I didn't believe in myself, you know, enough that I could do it. And I, I was scared to go and take it and maybe fail, you know, um, it, it, you know, I, I, what I'm, what I've learned, like I said, is don't, don't do what I did. You know, you don't need to wait nine years. Um, and you know, sometimes the failure is what teaches us the most lessons. So, um, exactly. I could have taken the exam many years before, maybe I might've failed it. Um, but then I would have been able to, you know, know exactly what's on the exam, turn around and knock it out a few months later. So I wish I had, you know, maybe done that, but you know, just my story is that for whatever reason, I just didn't, didn't think that I was ready. And I just kept, I have to read one more book. I have to, and I think I overdid it. I think I overdid it. I mean, I literally read thousands upon thousands of pages worth of material. I, one time I put all the material together that I studied for that first JNCIE, and it was a, about three or four foot tall stack of books that I had read. Uh, so I think I, like, I think I overdid it. <laughs> it. It's funny. It's like, there's a lot of like common stories between the two of us. I got married in the July and then the following year in January, I passed my CCIE. Mm -hmm. My poor wife, you know, oh, yeah. she had to put up with me studying for my CCIE. Um, but I, I love what you said, you know, there's no shame in failing. And mm -hmm. I always like to say with search, right, if you fail, it's not like you have to go and do another year of university. I mean, if you fail today, you take what you've learned, you go and fix those bad areas, like you said, and then next month you go and do it again if you can. Let, let me tell you a story on the on the failure. So I had, all, for the most part, I've, I've passed almost all, you know, I, the very first exam I ever took, which was like my Novell administration exam for Netware 3.12, I failed that one. That was the very first certification I ever took. After that, I never failed any other exams until... Oh, wow. I never failed another exam until I got to doing my fourth JNCIE, uh, with the, which was the JNCIE data center. And I failed that one three times. And I will tell you right now that I was starting to question whether I actually was worth my salt as an, I mean, so here I am, I'm replaying Dude. those guys, <laughs> those guys from my, yep. you know, yep. my early career, you call yourself an engineer. And yep. I'm literally saying that to myself, I started to question, you know, my whole world turned upside down. It took me, it took me, I had to, it took me four times to pass that data center uh, exam. It was very, very tough. 
I'm, I'm glad you said that though, because it's like we said earlier, you know, everyone will think that you're just a genius because you're just like knocking these things out. But it's a, it's a encouraging to hear that you failed it four times because that's an encouragement for everyone else. There's a lot of people that, you know, oh, Stefan, you're a genius. No, I, I, anybody, I will tell you right now, any viewer on this show can do what I did. Anybody. You just need to put the time and the effort into it. That's that's all that it takes. It's not about most of this stuff is, yeah. You have to have you have to be intelligent, you know, to 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 grasp these concepts. But anybody can do it if you just put the time and effort into it. But it, I love the it's been it's been proven over and over again that intelligence isn't the solution. It's hard work and putting the time in. Yeah, like you, you put the time and you yeah. put in the work. Obviously, mm-hmm. you have to have a certain aptitude for the stuff, but. What's that? What's that saying in the gym? The gyms don't, the, the weights don't 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 lift themselves. Right. Kind of thing. It's like you yeah. have to put the work in, right? You have to be disciplined, and it's like you know a lot. Yeah. Maybe uh, this might be too much information, but one of the things that I normally do when I'm pursuing a certification is I kind of set a goal in mind. Like here's when I would like to sit for the exam, um, and then I sort of quantify. All right, here's all the material that I need to get through between now and then. Let's say it's two books that I have to read between you know, now and three months from now. And and those two books are about 2000 pages. Well, I'll do the math. Here's how many pages I need to read per day if I want to hit my target. And you got to stick to that. And if you miss a day, let's say it's 17 pages a day. I need to read 17 pages a day. If I miss a day, well, I have to read 34 pages the next day. And you have to show that level of discipline or else you'll just, uh, it's it's difficult, but you know, People that are disciplined tend to accomplish their goals uh, a little bit easier. You, or, you know, when you when you miss a deadline, you just have to be willing to like kind of recalibrate. All right, I'm going to have to do 34 pages today. Or if I miss three days in a row, I'm doing, you know, 52 pages or something, 54 pages. And that's definitely not too much information. You should actually give us more. So have you got any, because a lot of people are like, okay, how do you give, give me study tips? Give me like advice. Because you've, you've been on this journey. You've got five of these, man, it's insane. Uh, what other tips have you learned along the way? This isn't necessarily a tip, but we were talking a little bit about, you're talking about money and people, you know, the, the issues with spending money. And let me talk a little bit about that for just a minute, because this is a lesson that I've really learned over the years. You might be in a, in a job where, you're, you're making decent money, you've got, you know, you're in IT, but perhaps you want to elevate your career to the next level and you want to pursue some certifications or you want to pursue some, some training. There are just unfortunately a lot of employers out there that don't make that investment in their employees. Um, kudos to the ones that do, but I've seen that there's plenty that don't. Or um, maybe you want to, let's say I, I, I'm doing service provider type work, but I want to start learning more about security. So my employer may not necessarily want to, you know, approve that training for me because it's not really directly in my scope of work. Right. So, you know, for those that are already maybe already making some money, you're in the industry and you want to maybe upskill, you want to elevate your career, you want to learn some new skills. I will tell you right now, if your employer isn't willing to invest in you, you should be willing to invest in you. It's the best investment you can make is spending your own money. That has never stopped me when I wanted to pursue something. You know, sometimes it's a difficult pill to swallow because these trainings are not cheap. You know, it might be three, four thousand, five thousand dollars for a one week. Um, but it's always in my case, um, paid back in dividends. So that's, that's a bit of advice for people is just be willing to invest in yourself. Um, number two, I would say is, um, if you are interested in pursuing one of these certifications, especially the higher level, one of the best ways that you can motivate yourself is to go and actually sign up and pay for the the expert level exam, get it on the calendar because now you're kind of on the hook, right? It's like, all right, I know I'm scheduled to take this in three months. So I've really got to get my ducks in a row because, you know, granted, you could reschedule the exam if you wanted to, but just having that date on a calendar, just it's visualizing it and seeing it like, okay, I've got to make some tangible progress because I've got a date in mind. So goal setting, that's really important. Sort of just looking at the the mountain, you know, you, so when you look at these books, right, some of them, they're like, you know, this thick and, and it just seems like it's going to be a real uh, difficult or like a Herculean task 
to get through a book of this nature. But guess what? I've done, I've done like 30 books of this size in my career. It's just, if you just doing 15, 20 pages a day, you'd be amazed at how quickly you're, you know, you're knocking a hundred pages out uh, every five days. And, you know, before you know it, a, a 1500 page book is, is, is finished. So having that discipline, having a structure, setting goals, um, investing in yourself, using things like the Elevate community to reach out to other people who have already passed these exams and getting some tri- some type of an idea from them. That That's probably one of the best things you can do is networking with, with folks, similar like-minded folks that are pursuing the same um, track or have already done that. So you can kind of learn from their experience. But yeah, I mean, there's so many uh, good lessons, but yeah, I think for me, the one that is really resonates the most is invest in yourself. And I don't think enough people do that. I think a lot of people want to blame their employers. Oh, well, I want to do this training, but my employer won't pay for it. Well, you know what? Invest in yourself. Invest in yourself. So then the, the, the flip question on that, or the other side of that question is, in your experience, when you got these certs, did it, did, did it change your life? Did it open doors? Absolutely. Because there's no point getting the cert for nothing, right? Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it changed my life in a lot of different ways. Um, I'll talk about the finality of that, which is now I have my own business, which is wonderful and amazing. And it's great that I don't have to report to other people. The immediate impact of getting some of these expert level certifications was that I was invited to the table with really smart people that I respected. And all of a sudden they respected me more and felt like I had something to offer as well. So it was getting me invited to tables that previously I wasn't really um, privy to or I wasn't invited to. So getting the ability to work on um, more interesting projects, more challenging projects that really um, pushed me to you know, elevate my knowledge. And uh, yeah, so those are the types of things. But not only that, but the career options really started to open up as well. So, you know, all of a sudden I'm getting lots of emails from prospective employers and it's giving you leverage. If you're happy, maybe in the job that you're at right now, but you're recognizing that you can make more money, at least you have a little bit of leverage. Um, You know, you're bringing something to the table. You have uh, credentials to back it up. Um, so it definitely helped me to move up in terms of pay scale, um, give me better um, career options, job um, you know opportunities. And then ultimately, I think for me, where this has really um, the, the the finality of all this sort of journey is that now I'm in business for myself. And I've been in business for four years and I haven't had to report to anybody else for the last four years. And that takes its own sort of discipline. Uh, it but does, it's yeah. it's really nice to um, be the maker of my own destiny. And, um, you know, I think after four years, I can effect- effectively say, yeah, I, I can do it on my own. And I don't think, I think a, a big part of that is the fact that I have these certifications. The certifications sort of helped me open a lot of doors, it enabled me to write a couple of books, um, do a lot of speaking opportunities, those types of things. It's really sort of establish, um, you know, my reputation in the industry. And that then facilitated me starting my own business. So I don't think that any of that stuff would have been possible. Maybe had I not started that journey uh, many, many moons ago. And I mean, I love what you said, though. I mean, encouragement for everyone is like, it's you're not going to get this in one day. Rome wasn't built in a day and you didn't get five Gen CIEs in like a week. It's a journey, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's something that is a continuous journey. This field, you've got to constantly evolve and you've got to constantly learn because the things that I learned 20 years ago, some of them are still relevant, right? But there's so much new stuff. There's so much new stuff. So you are going to have to be, if you want to get into IT, you have to be a lover of learning. I think if you want to be really successful, um, you have to be somebody that enjoys learning and is, you know, okay with the fact that um, you're going to probably be on a constant evolution. Yeah, no, I mean, it's an encouragement in for new people as well, right? Because if, if you're like, perhaps you're in another job and you don't like it and you want to get into IT, you know, what's hot today it wasn't hot 10, 20 years ago when, when we, we started. Um, you you can become an expert in, in this hot new thing. Within two years, you're well known in that area. And I love that story. You know, it was 12 months where, from the point where they were like, 
hating on you to like they're coming to you for advice. Um, so it doesn't take like 20 years to to become successful in, a, in an area if you choose something that's new. Yeah, I mean, in this day and age, I think things are moving so rapidly. Like if there's a new technology and you've got an expert in that technology, realistically speaking, how many years experience do they have? Like, you know, we're, we're talking chat GPT and stuff that, that is pretty new, right? So if you've got an expert out there who's talking about chat GPT and, and, you know, using chat GPT to, you know, build some kind of AI engine for your company or something like that, realistically speaking, how long has that, that person been an expert in chat GPT? It's only been out for seven or eight months, you know? So (laughs) one of the things that I like to say is that, um, the expert in the room has is is the person that's read only one or two pages more than everybody else in the room. So that's it. I love that. I mean, let's talk about AI because that's um I a lot of people are worried about AI. Like is it even worth becoming a network engineer? Is it worth getting into cyber? Is it worth getting into tech? Because AI is going to eat all these jobs. So I I do think so. I still think it's worth getting into a, uh into networking. Case in point, um, one of my customers is a very large bank uh, in the U.S. I've been working with them for about two years now on their SDN deployment, um, you know, which is finally just getting launched right now. We're just going live with like one of our very first data centers. Um, but I'm telling you right now, this this um, effort to have a more software defined networking, it's all about programmability in this particular bank's network, right? It's um, if a data center goes down, let's say they had a major geographic fire or you know tornado just tore a building down. The idea with what we're doing is, as long as they have new equipment and they just you know put that uh, bring that new equipment up, they could replay the scripts and the playbooks and everything and have that data center back up and running within about two hours. Okay. Oh, wow. yeah. And, you know, all the things that we're looking at doing with the, um, you know, using machine learning and AI and software defined principles to be able to make the network behave um, and adapt more quickly in real time to network failures and things of that nature. But in my experience, in, on this particular project, at least. And I think this kind of um, goes across the board with some of my other customers that are also doing similar types of things. It's not eliminating jobs. It's creating more jobs. <laughs> there's, there, there's so, I mean, so you've got to, you know, just looking at software defined principles. Now you need people that have some devops type of background. So I'm not saying that you might not have to learn new skills, you absolutely may have to learn new skills. And I think the network engineer of of today and especially tomorrow will definitely have to have some programming chops under their belt. Um, Not hardcore, but you have to understand how to do maybe basic Python scripting or um, some forms of scripting so that you can, yeah, Ansible and things of that nature, how to run playbooks, um, you know, uh, Terraform or whatever have you. But I, I don't suspect, I mean, we've been talking about software-defined networking for years now, and the vision of it eliminating jobs, um, I don't think we're there yet. And I don't think we're going to be there for a long time. And again, I think you're going to, even even if you, all the things that we do today, let's say you have a network engineer that logs onto a switch and turns up a VLAN, that might disappear, like in terms of the person logging into the CLI. You know, and some of those things may be auto provision from some kind of like a web interface that a customer chooses. But who's going to basically troubleshoot when the scripts don't work properly or when um, the script, you know, says it pushed the VLAN out, but you know, you're still going to need somebody to, that understands all these things and be able to log on to devices and, and try to really understand. It's, I don't think it's eliminating jobs. I think it's going to, in a way, it's going to create more. It's interesting what you, what you said there, because I mean, that's exactly the problem. What happens when the, when the, when the, when the, when the, when the storm comes or there's a fire on right. the network, you know, who's going to solve that? The AI or the script or you? And it's going to, I would rather have you on site than, than some, some AI, right? I'm not saying that, that eventually it won't eliminate jobs, but let's look at Tesla, for example, right? How long has it taken them to get full self-driving? I mean, I have Tesla. My FSD is still in beta. It's pretty jerky. I don't know. It's going to take a while before we have this stuff at a point where it's foolproof. And I mean, we're kind of in the infancy in terms of software-defined networking 
all this kind of stuff. I think we've got a long way to go before we're eliminating jobs as a result of it. I mean, that's that's very encouraging. And I mean, you've I just want to recap, you've got like data center, enterprise, service provider, cloud, uh, and what's the other one I'm missing? Security, did we say that? Security, yeah, so I shouldn't have missed that one. So that was the one I actually wanted to highlight is um, you've touched all these different areas. If I was starting today, or if I'm trying to transition, what would you recommend I look at? Yeah, security's been very hot recently, but you know, is it AI, is it security? What sort of area would you, or what advice would you well, give? Well, if we're bringing AI into the mix, I will say getting credentials in machine learning and you know, data analytics, data science, um, AI, absolutely hands down. I think that's such an emerging field that's so hot right now. And I think um, we're just sort of kind of starting at the beginning of this sort of revolution. So, I mean, that, that to me is a, is a sort of a no brainer, but in terms of like, maybe if we're talking about networking versus cyber, now I love networking. That's really near and dear to my heart. But if I'm quite frank, I think I've seen the numbers in terms of cyber. Um, and there is something like over the next 10 years, there's going to be a, like, there are like something like 2 million unfulfilled cybersecurity positions over the next 10 years. So if somebody's looking <laughs> for a field where you're almost guaranteed to get a job, um, you know, cyber is a pretty good, a pretty good field to choose. Um, and there's, it's always evolving as well, you know, so there's always something new to learn and malicious actors are always evolving in their exploit techniques and things of that nature. So uh, that's a that's a great field for also for somebody who loves to learn. But my my path was I like both. I like both, and I don't necessarily think people need to. I realize in the real world, you're typically going to get a job as like a network engineer, or you're going to get a job working on the security side. But you know, if you enjoy both, try to find the position that would give you the ability to do both. Yeah, because you, I mean, you're really high, highly certified in firewalls. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I mean, I, so in addition to the JNCIE SEC, I've got um, Palo, I've got multiple Palo firewall certifications I've, at the highest level within Palo. I've got my CISSP, which is, you know, it's more like from a CISO type perspective. It's not super technical, but I've been working with a lot of different security products, right? And I, I, I don't like to limit myself to one particular set of technology and I'm constantly evolving. Like for example, lately I'm really into wireless. I'm really go getting into that. So I've been doing a lot of stuff with uh, the MIST wireless and that's been really exciting, uh, especially the AI stuff that that's uh, inside MIST. But yeah, I don't want to pigeonhole myself into one particular technology because it's all so interesting to me. Like, I don't want to just be a guy that's a, doing data center switching, or I don't want to just do service rider routing. I, I want to touch it all. And, uh, you know, I think the people that are going to be really successful in this, yeah, you got to have, you, you, you have generalists and you have experts, but I think a lot of experts like to have a broad, um, you know, maybe just go a few inches deep, but 50 foot wide is pretty cool. But I, I love what, you know, it's a whole thing, like who do you want on site? If, the, if, if you really want like someone to consult, I'd rather have you come and consult to my company because you've got this breadth of knowledge. I mean, you, you, you're not only like wide, but you're deep as well in so many areas. But I mean, like someone who's just a, for instance, if someone just knows like routing and switching or just knows like wi wireless, they might not understand the security side, whereas you understand all of it. That was sort of, so my sort of goal, I don't know if I talked about this earlier, but my goal in my career was like, what what do I have to do to get to, what, what is somebody that's at like a CTO level? What is the level of knowledge that they have? And you see that they, they're pretty deep, but they're also wide. Um, and, you know, because you can go to, I mean, a good CTO understands the business aspects, the impacts, um, they understand the technical impacts, um, and they should understand a wide variety of topics. Um, they're not just a CTO in routing, you know, or CTO in, you know, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's kind of like if you approach it from where do you, where do you want to go? Like, and for me it was, Hey, I want to like apply my career in such a way that like I would achieve like a CTO level of knowledge at the end of it. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why I just like, I kind of can't keep still to one particular thing. I just love learning. There's so many cool things to learn about all the time. I, um, my fiance works in AI. So, 
uh, we are always talking about. She works actually at Microsoft, does a lot of AI stuff. And uh, it's just an exciting time to be in technology right now. And there's, I mean, it just seems like it hasn't stopped, you know, since I got into this field, it's just been constantly evolving. And it's a great field for anybody that's a, that wants to keep continuous evolution and learning. But I love it, like on the networking side, I mean, if you, if you're a, someone who wants to do like core or you know, pure networking, I mean, that's where you can start, but networking's everywhere. I, I see it a lot. I've, I've spoken to other people and one of the problems in cyber is that some guys don't have a deep understanding of networking and that can mm-hmm. be a, a problem. Um, so, I mean, you could touch cyber, but be more networking focused. It's not like you have to just go with the hot stuff. I mean, there's there, there's lots of jobs for networking in, engineers, right? Yeah, definitely. There's there's great jobs out there. You didn't complete your degree, right? That is correct. So if I was starting today and I wanted to be a network engineer, would you recommend certs or degree? So this was sort of the conundrum that I was faced when I started going to school and I was um, learning. So I did do some college, but the curriculum that I was learning was outdated. Um, and it wasn't, it was, you know, they were talking about things that hadn't been used for several years in the real world. Personally, I'm not necessarily advocating this path for everybody, but I think it's a lot easier if you look at, hey, I'm going to go to a four-year degree and you're looking at the ROI on um, how much you're going to spend for a four-year degree. If you are ultimately going to get into networking, I think you can achieve a better return on your investment just by going the route of self-study, maybe get yourself into some highly focused technical training. Um, That's maybe six months to nine months versus four years. And you'll end up spending a lot less and you'll be able to get right into the industry and, you know, kind of move your, your way up from there. Now that is not to say that's necessarily the path that everybody should take. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, when I was working at UUNet, uh, I did have the luxury ultimately of working myself into um, really amazing projects like DWDM and optical projects. We were looking at Lambda switching and all these really cool things. And I'm literally working hand in hand with people that had PhDs in physics and, you know, um, these types of things. I managed to get there through lots and lots of hard work. The four-year degree plus maybe another two years with a master's might have gotten me in the door a little bit quicker, but you're still talking about I would have had to do six years of college education to get to that point, just to be invited to the table Uh, because most of those guys had master's or PhDs. Uh, But I think in reality, just looking in my own story, I think I managed to get there in about two or three years. So I'm, maybe I, I think I'm, I might I might have beat the guy that spent six years going to school in terms of ROI. So again, I'm not I'm not necessarily advocating people just don't go to college. You know, I think it is that that's that's valuable for certain people. But I think for IT, everything's changing so quick. Half the stuff you learn in college is already outdated by the time you get out. You can just get in. You can spend a lot uh, less money, maybe just pursuing certifications, self study technology training at uh, specialized technology schools. And uh, you're, you're pretty much off to the races uh, in, in a pretty short amount of time. And I mean, and the, the crazy thing about the US I find is the debt that people end up with. Right. The college debt situation in the US is like, wow. I mean, you go and do you can get a Juniper cert for $50 and compare that against a, right. a degree. I mean, and I'm not saying they're exactly the same, but the point is if you do a few certs, it can open doors, right? Absolutely. Would you hire a college graduate or would you hire someone with some some Juniper certs? And I mean, I know it's a really nasty question, yeah. but like if you're, you, you've been down this road a bit, right? You know, be re- ultimately dependent upon which person I really liked working with yeah. better. But yeah, I would yeah, absolutely exactly. hire somebody that had no college degree um, and simply had certifications. And if I saw that that was a person that was hungry um, and had that drive, that that's the thing that I would really be looking for more is somebody who's saying, hey, I'm... I really want to get into this industry. I want to learn. Um, I'm going to work hard. Those are the types of things that I think would resonate with me more than, hey, I did a four-year degree and a specialization in this. But you know, it really depends on the situation. But I absolutely would have no hesitation with hiring somebody with without a degree, uh, just with some technology certifications. I love what you said there because everyone I interview, well, I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people that I interview say very similar things. Hunger, drive. Yep. willingness to learn. It's the personality traits that are more important. Those are going to be the people that are going to show up every day with that, you know, 
um, passion. I think having passion is really important too, right? Hopefully everybody that's watching this, you you're love IT uh, or you're very interested in getting into IT. But I think that is such a important component um, to success is that you love what you do or you're passionate about it. If you're just doing it to make money, you'll never you'll never be passionate about it and you'll never probably really be able to elevate your career to the level that other people may, may be able to because they're passionate. Um, when you're passionate about something, it just, uh, it drives you. And I mean, you're not, you're not going to study like you did. I mean, if you don't like this, you're not going to want to study for the next 20 years. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's really exciting. I haven't done a certification in a while, um, but I, I had mentioned I'm, I was, uh, I've been playing around with Juniper Mist a lot lately their wireless platform. So I am actually just started pursuing another certification because I don't have the missed AI um, certs. And it's so, it's so exciting to like open up the courseware and start going through it. And it's like, Oh, I'm back to learning again. Um, one of the things I think, uh, David, you and I have a similar background is we both have been trainers. Um, so that's always been something that I love. I love teaching other people, a, a common thread amongst people that really enjoy teaching is they also enjoy learning. So I'm, learning this material right now. And it's re- super exciting to be uh, back into like a learning mode again. How is Mist AI or how is the Mist stuff different to like traditional Wi-Fi? It's awesome, man. So, uh, God, I guess I could go on a, a long time about Mist, but I will tell you, um, I have customers that have had Mist deployed now for three years and literally never have to do anything, never have to fix anything. Um, like I had a customer... Uh, an entire county in uh, Pennsylvania is one of my customers, and they have a pretty large missed deployment. And they just came up to their three year renewal on their subscriptions. And, you know, I shot them an email and they were like, oh, wow, like we, did, we totally forgot about these renewals. Like we, we don't really ever have to. It's to, to them, they like almost forgot it's there because it's seamless. They, I said, I, we kind of talked a little bit about how many issues they've had over the last couple of years. They've had like two issues in three years and they pretty much self-healed and fixed themselves. But the AI is really, really cool um, with the Marvis, uh, which is kind of like, you know, it's a play on the Jarvis that uh, Tony Stark had. But yeah, the Marvis is the uh, the AI engine for Mist, and it's pretty awesome the way that it just kind of clicks you through um, this problem that you're seeing in the network, here's the high probability is that it's being caused by this based on our machine learning algorithm and other customers who have had similar types of problems. Here's like, they give you like the percentages, like 67%. It's because they've got, you know, like a faulty DHCP or something like that. And, you know, it's kind of walks you through it and then it gives you suggestions on how to fix it. Um, and oftentimes if you just follow their suggestions, it, fi- it fixes it. Um, and half the time it just fixes it on its own. It's pretty, it's pretty darn cool. I, so I talk about AI. There's two things that I, I was just thinking about is number one, it can make a, a network engineer's life a lot easier, right? Because it's, it's helping you. And uh, number two, though, it is already, it might replace some jobs already there, but it's, um, it, they, you're still in control. I, I think the great thing about AI is hopefully, you know, we won't be configuring VLANs like we did all our lives, you know, it's uh, yeah. those low boring tasks can get given to an AI or to a machine right. and you and I can focus on more important problems, right? I, I totally agree. Yeah. I mean, the, we might, the things that we do on a day-to-day basis might change, but it hopefully will let us do more interesting things that are uh, more strategic in nature, you know, as opposed to having to deal with all the tactical level. Um, let's focus on big picture business type things to make the business, you know, work better as opposed to, I don't want to do VLANs all day. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's cool. Like yeah, the first couple you- of times, you know, you're like, oh, this is yeah. neat. I, when you're doing your CCNA or something like, oh, it's cool. This is a VLAN, but you know, I don't want to do that across the network, you know, it, at scale. It, it's fun to learn the, the basics and you need to learn like how to use notepad or whatever. But I mean, at some point you get tired of that stuff. And I I, I think the AI wave, uh, chat GPT has just highlighted that. It's here. Mm-hmm. You're not going to change yeah. the world. Sorry, you're not going to be able to put the genie back in the bottle if you like. You either ride this wave and you become one of the people that become really successful with it, like you and, and your wife's doing AI at Microsoft, 
or you're going to get left behind, right? Did, have you seen Network GPT yet? Yeah, I actually interviewed John. At, I, I think it's the same thing. If, if we're talking about the same thing, yeah. John, who yeah. wrote that that, right. that plugin, right? Go yeah. On. Sorry, go on. It's wicked cool, man. I mean, I, I think it's more like a proof of concept at this point. Yeah. But the yeah. fact that it's, you can- You did it like in a month or something. It was crazy. Right. Go on. Yeah. But using um, human- friendly language, you know, and letting me just go in and type, hey, connect to this Cisco device, use this username to connect. And then bam, it's connected. And then say, configure me. Uh, I, I, hey, you know, right now it might be, hey, configure me a VLAN. But in the future, it, it'll probably be even more intelligent. It's literally just say, I want to connect this PC on this switch to this PC on this switch, make it happen. And then the, the network does it, just kind of like able to make it all happen behind the scenes. I think that's pretty cool. But the network GPT plugin, when I saw it, I was like, this is pretty impressive. It's I just, you can kind of get a flavor for where things are going. But that just shows you, you know, if you if you can like you've done, you you've never stopped learning. You've learned all these different disciplines. If you can jump on the next wave, you will be a highly sought after person. I mean if I look at the wages that AI engineers are getting, it's insane. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else you want to share or wrap up with? Um, any encouragement or final words to people who are watching? Uh, I think as a final word of uh, encouragement, I just say to folks, you know, uh, believe in yourself, invest in yourself and, um, you know, never give up hope. I, I mean, I, I'm, I think I'm a perfect example of I can do five JNCIEs and I can do all these other certifications. If I can have my own business, uh, then pretty much any, everybody here can do it. You just got to have a little bit of faith in yourself, a little bit of belief and, uh, you know, put some hard work and dedication. There's nothing that's ever going, you have all the belief in the world in yourself, but you still have to put some hard work and, and time into these things. But uh, if, if I can do it, then pretty much anybody here on this, uh, this show can, can do it as well. Perhaps you can just tell us about your socials and your company website again. Uh, so um, our website is www.spfirst.net or you could go to shortestpathfirst.net. Either one will work. My personal is at sfuant. Um, and then on LinkedIn, it's just Stefan Fuant. So for everyone who's watching, once again, I'll put those links below. So go and show the love. Um, please don't flood Stefan with a million questions. But, you know, that's what I love about the world today. Any one of us can connect to someone who's got like five JNCIEs. It's amazing that and that, that we can do this. And Stefan, thanks so much, you know, for sharing with the community and, and being willing to give back. It, it means a lot. So thanks. My so pleasure. Much. It's been great speaking with you today. Thank you.